In this video, I'll talk about synthetic materials, which are human-made materials, where they come from, and how they impact society. Synthetic materials are materials that are human-made, like houses, computers, pencils, backpacks, books, all of these things we make from natural resources. So natural resources are materials that come from Earth, things like rocks, petroleum, natural gas, animals, honey, all of these things are things that we get from Earth to make all of these synthetic materials. For example, the pencils that we use today um, have to be made from natural resources. What we generally call the lead inside pencils is actually not lead at all. It's a mixture of graphite and clay. When pencils were made in the 18th century, the pencil makers thought it was lead, but they were cor corrected much later when chemists found out what it was, um, but the name stuck until today. In any case, they're made from natural resources and we put them together in a certain way. Same with houses. So houses have natural resources like wood, iron, copper, sand to make the um, glass windows, aluminum, all of these things are put together in a certain way to make a synthetic structure. To make new materials uh, from natural resources, they undergo something that we call a chemical change. This means that the molecules that make up the natural resource get rearranged or put together in a new way to make something new. And we say that the resource has undergone chemical reactions. So that a chemical reaction is a process in which the molecules of one or more chemicals are rearranged to form a new substance. For example, let's say you had two gases. You have hydrogen, which is flammable, and oxygen that we breathe in. If you can fuse them together, you make something completely new. You make water, and that is not a gas, it's a liquid. So chemical changes rearrange molecules in a certain way so that the end product is something new with new properties. And we do this in our kitchens all the time, every day. We get ingredients from natural resources like plants and animals. We mix them together. We might add some heat. And then all of the molecules are rearranged in a different way to make something that feels, smells, and tastes different than the original ingredients. So the kitchen is kind of like a lab where you make new products all of the time. And this is something we did in our lab where we mixed glue and borax and water together to make a new substance with new properties. So why do we make all of these synthetic materials? The simple answer is that we have uses for them. There's a societal need for synthetic materials and we can make synthetic materials that function better or more efficiently than natural resources. We can make synthetic materials with different properties that natural resources may not have. We can make them flexible. We can make them soft or stretchy. We can make them long, um, long lasting and strong. And we can even improve the quality of life with all of these synthetic materials. There are positive impacts of these synthetic materials like what we just said. Um, in other words, these synthetic materials can benefit us in many ways. But there are also negative impacts to society. Synthetic materials can have some disadvantages. Not only do we deplete our natural resources when we make them, but they can also pollute the environment. So to illustrate both the positive and negative impacts, we're gonna take a look at plastic. Most plastics nowadays come from petroleum. The oil gets separated into different parts in a refinery and some of those parts are moved to a different factory and made into plastics. So a typical barrel of crude oil gets refined into about 45 gallons of products and most of that goes to fuel and about six gallons of that gets made into other products including plastic. So we benefit from this natural resource because we get fuel and other products out of it. Plastic was mass produced during World War II. They've been around since about the 1830s, um, but World War II really helped them get mass produced on a large scale. Uh, in 1931, this is Wallace Carruthers. He was working at DuPont and he invented a silk-like plastic that we now call nylon. And it has a lot of the properties of silk, but it's much, much stronger. 
Nylon and other plastics became hugely important during World War II, and this contributed to their mass production. Uh, silk was used to make parachutes, and during the war, silk was in short supply. And so nylon stockings were um, reprocessed into making all the parachutes that were needed. Polyvinyl chloride, which was created in 1872, was used to insulate electrical wires, and so that was mass produced for aircraft during World War II. And we still use PVC today in many ways. Polyacrylics, like plexiglass, were transparent and lightweight, and they didn't shatter like glass. So this was very beneficial for airplanes during the war. And we still use plexiglass today for lots of different kinds of windows and shower doors and things like that. So it's hard to imagine life without plastic. Pla plastic helps us every day. We carry stuff with it. We heal people with it. We search the internet with it. It helps us travel. We feed ourselves with plastic, spoons and forks, um, and we carry things around in plastic. So all of these things are undoubtedly benefits to society and improve our quality of life. But there's a huge cost associated with all of these benefits. The negative impact of plastic is really staggering when you take a look at um, the world around us. The world is polluted with billions of pounds of trash each year. And not only that, but ecosystems are suffering. Animals often mistake plastic for food and will just eat it and it sits there in their stomach. Um, if they don't eat it, they're often tangled in the plastic and they can get caught underwater and a lot of mammals or other animals that need air to breathe um, will end up just dying or suffocating. And so this is a scientist who has dissected a small turtle and you can see all of the plastics that it had eaten and all the plastics um, from the stomach made their way through the intestines and sometimes they can really tear up the insides of an animal. The Ocean Conservancy does annual cleanups where volunteers will go out to the beach, collect trash, and then count their fines. These are the top 10 items found on beaches, and these staggering numbers are just from one day of cleanup. And a lot of the plastic doesn't go away. It either just stays around for years and years and years, or it gets broken down in these tiny pieces of plastic that we call microplastics. Uh, sometimes they're so small that you need a microscope to see them and zooplankton will often eat these microplastics and if, the, if they don't die, then a fish will eat that, another fish will eat the fish, and eventually uh, it goes all the way up the food chain and so we end up getting the plastic in our bodies. So where does all of this stuff come from? Uh, a lot of the marine debris comes from litter. It also comes from dumping, just boats and fishing, uh, fishing ships just dumping their ropes in the ocean. It comes from storm water drains. But the most significant source of uh, plastic is actually mismanaged plastic from municipal homes and manufacturing industries all around the world. So this map shows mismanaged plastic from different countries that have coastline. And you can see in the pie charts the red part of the pie is the amount of mismanaged plastic. And you can see that a lot of the nations over in Asia mismanage their plastic quite a bit. Here is a graph from the same study. The study was published in 2015. Uh, this is a projection. So in 2010 is the dark blue and the lighter blue is the projection of mismanaged plastic in 2025. And these are the top 20 20 ranked by billions of pounds of mismanaged waste that ends up in the oceans. So you can see at the far left, China in about 2010 had 20 billion pounds of mismanaged plastic dumped into the ocean. And then all the way far at the right, the U.S. had maybe about um, one about one and a half billion pounds of trash, which is not as much as China, but it is still a staggering amount of trash that goes into the ocean. So the problem seems pretty daunting, um, but there are ways that you can help whenever possible. If you see trash on the ground, just pick it up um, and always reduce, reuse, and recycle. And please ask other people to do the same. So to summarize, 
Synthetic materials come from natural resources such as petroleum, metals, plants, and animals, and synthetic materials are often created by chemical reactions. There are numerous benefits to synthetic materials such as plastic. Um, in fact, if you check your tag on your shirt or your pants, there's a really good chance that uh, your clothing is made from something called polyester, which is recycled from plastics. And then lastly, the benefits to plastic come at a huge cost. Not only do we deplete our natural resources to make synthetic materials, um, but it also produces a huge amount of pollution, um, mostly from waste mismanagement. And this can have dire consequences on ecosystems. So just remember to recycle whenever possible. And that is synthetic materials come from natural resources and impact society.